Hello and welcome to the Al Atiyah Foundation podcast. My name is Stephen Cole. Today we're joined by Mohammed Hassan, the Energy Industry and Sustainability Director for the Middle East, Africa and Turkey at Microsoft. Now, prior to joining Microsoft, he held various technical and business leadership roles across the MEA with multinational organizations like Emerson and Schneider Electric, leading strategic projects, developing the accounts of major IOCs and business uh, development. Uh, Mr. Hassan, thank you for being with us today. Thank you very much, Stephen. I'm very happy to be with you here today and with Alatea Foundation. I'd like to start with an overview of some of the work you do. So can you briefly explain to those of us who don't know the detail of cloud computing, artificial intelligence, and of course the internet of things? That's a great question, Stephen. You know, um, I'd like to definitely start with the basics. Uh, you know, I usually give some uh, sessions to our interns in uh, Microsoft uh, Energy Department when we have a batch of interns. And the first word they hear is cloud computing, digital transformation, AI, but nobody actually comes and tells them what is digital transformation <laughs> or what is this technologies, right? And uh, this is a great challenge So um, for, for this interns. So uh, right now, I think it's very good to go back to the basics and define the cloud computing, which is the delivery of different services through the internet. That includes data storage, servers, database, networking, and software. So there is three main types, I would say, of cloud computing services. It's infrastructure as a service, or what we refer to as IAAS, IAS, and platform as a service, or what do we prefer to as PaaS, P-A-A-S, and software as a service. With we refer to as SAAS. Uh, this is the main um, three types of cloud computing. When it comes to AI, as artificial intelligence, as the name um, you know is obvious, it's the intelligence by machine or a software uh, that mimics or try to approach the human intelligence. And there is, let's say, subsets of the artificial intelligence as well, or let's say two types, what we call cognitive uh, artificial intelligence. And this is, for example, video analytics, right? Uh, the ones that you get on CCTVs, or we have these days the chatbots, when you log to your utility provider and you have an automatic response or any website, and you have a chatbot that can understand the human language and can give you answers to your questions. Or for example, when you search pictures on your phone by the name, so you tag, you can tag a person, uh, right. for example, as your son, and you search that picture, show me all the pictures I have on my phone for my son, and then it shows you all the pictures. And then the different, uh, the other subset, the famous one is machine learning. And this is a pattern, more of a pattern recognition and prediction applications. Um, uh, please go ahead, Stephen. No, I was going to say, if we move on the Internet of Things, um, uh, very briefly in a paragraph, how would you describe in, that? In, in, in one sentence, it's, it's the physical objects with sensors, the processing ability, software and other technologies that connects and exchange the data that these sensors perceive. Gosh, that's, that's Internet of Things. That is extremely succinct. And, you know, I'm always impressed by people who can simplify the very complicated. So I'm most grateful to you for that. Um, how, how are these facets of modern day computing applicable to the energy industry? I'm, I'm thinking about refinery, logistical operations, the use of AI in subservice exploration or uh, in forecasting maintenance problems, detecting methane emissions, that kind of thing. Uh, that's a very good question. When this technology comes to... Uh... Uh, be applied in the energy industry. As you said, we have, uh, you know, let's say a full theme of what we call intelligent supply chain. And this is using AI, for example, to extract data from your ERP systems, from your suppliers, from your inventory, uh, spare parts, and so on, uh, from the ships that's arriving to your terminal, from the pipeline scheduling, and all this data is extracted 
monitored, analyzed by AI, where it can calculate all the possible scenarios, uh, you know, to optimize that supply and logistics operation, that supply chain operation. Um, that's one example. Uh, AI in subsurface exploration, there is so many applications for it. It goes beyond uh, reservoir modeling and so on, but it also optimizes as well the drilling. Uh, for example, you have AI-enabled geosteering, how to steer your drill vertically, horizontally, um, uh, under the ground, right? Using all the sensors and data that you're getting, how to enable real-time AI-enabled geosteering. Um, and predictive maintenance, you know, three, four years ago, predictive maintenance were the future, now it's, definitely uh, a reality for every operator. If you can uh, predict an equipment failure that can prevent an unplanned shutdown, you are also hitting your sustainability and production goals. Uh, you prevent flaring from the unplanned shutdown, you hit sustainability, you continue production, you reduce your downtime and so on. Uh, when it comes to detecting methane emissions as well using the AI and this technology, it comes, for example, the image analytics and video analytics. We use satellites today to detect methane emissions. We use the IoT sensors on the ground to zoom on the leak location so we can almost have near real time methane emission, whether it's fugitive emission or from flaring or from uh, uh, release valve or so on. So we can have near monitoring to the methane leaks and we can act immediately on that leak once we receive the alert. Yeah. That's very reassuring. Uh, moving on to the big um, subject for uh, energy, combating global warming, the cutting of greenhouse gases released into the atmosphere. They're great, great challenges for us, uh, for business, for energy, for humanity. What are the advances in monitoring technology, surface drones, satellite based, that can help countries and institutions meet their climate change goals? That's a great question, you know, and I think the oil and gas industry, especially, it's uh, responsible for around 24% of uh, the emissions worldwide. So that's a huge area that uh, we can definitely work on and uh, optimize in our industry. When it comes to the use of technologies, you know, of that um, to combat this emissions and reduce the impact, uh, it plays a great role. As I mentioned, you know, on the satellite, you can have a continuous monitoring uh, with a network of satellites using the AI again technology. You can have continuous data. So instead of having a data of one satellite, you can use data of two, three satellites. You can incorporate IoT devices on the ground. Uh, there are some companies as well. If you don't have satellite coverage, if it was a cloudy day, Machine learning can help you uh, identify it. Or if you are flying a fixed uh, wing plane with infrared sensors, for example, to detect these emissions. And then it can help you react. This detection is great. Uh, you cannot control what you're not measuring, but once you measure it, how to react and control these emissions as well. How to improve uh, the efficiency of your units on the ground uh, so that you can minimize the energy consumption. So. AI and technology, it's not the goal, but I'd say it's the glue that takes all these inputs together, uh, stitch it into, let's say, the right solution to minimize the emissions from the energy sector. Yeah, got it. Let, let's, let's come back down to earth and, and talk about what, how we're talking, because COVID-19, as you know, brought on, brought on the development of home working, the growth of comms platforms such as Zoom and how we're communicating Microsoft Teams. Did such software exist uh, in their current iterations before COVID, before the pandemic, or were those applications developed especially for just this dynamic situation? So definitely COVID-19 accelerated the development of these applications. It definitely existed. But we've seen, let's say, two years of digital transformation accelerated and done in two months, in the first two months of COVID, when everybody just had to switch to remote work. And uh, we didn't have a lot of features in the teams that was developed based on the remote work model. Uh, you know, and not only teams, I don't want to be specific to Microsoft or biased here, 
but there is a lot of technology that was enabled in these platforms. Noise suppression, for example. We all started working and then there is kids in the background, there's dogs barking, so this application started to put uh, background noise suppression. Uh, started to focus on the collaboration more, how to collaborate with your uh, co-workers, how to build apps inside these platforms. So you can run a poll, for example. Uh, so you can change um, the way you interact with your colleagues and collaborate. So definitely it accelerated and evolved these applications to something that we could have seen in five to seven years development. And uh, as we're talking about home workers, there are uh, an increasing number of them. And that means employers have a greater need for monitoring technology. Now, some states are worried about this, about how monitoring tech can be used. What are your thoughts on such technology and the new working conditions uh, some find themselves in? That's a great uh, question, Stephen. Once uh... All of us, we found ourselves in a remote working situation 100%. It was uh, a lot of, uh, let's say, pressure, uh, you know, how to stay productive, how to balance work-life balance. Uh, together, the border between, you know, your personal life and your professional life started to uh, disappear a little bit. And uh, I wouldn't say that um, the technologies developed by the employers was to monitor, uh, you know, individual behaviors. Uh, rather than monitor the organizational behavior. Uh, so there is an ethical, let's say, AI, which is let's, the machine learning, that uh, algorithm that this can figure out the organizational behavior. For example, if you're a manager with one employee or two employees, you cannot see the states. For example, it has to be a minimum of five, six employees, so you can see the collective productivity of this group. And then as you go up in the hierarchy, you can see a full view on your organization. Uh, it's not only in the employer side to monitor, but it's also for the employee itself, right? So it can tell you how productive you are. It, it can show you some statistics that you can only see how much email you responded, uh, minutes you spend in meetings, and how many hours or minutes you spent after your working hours. So you can take care of your personal life as well. So if you see, can come at the end of the week, it tells you you worked two hours out of your working hours this week. So try to improve that uh, in the next week. And then you can monitor uh, and keep the balance and reduce your pressure. So it actually works both ways. Uh, and, you know, here comes the ethics part of every organization to work on that as organizational behavior to uh, increase their efficiency, productivity, but also to keep the employee rights to have their own space in this hybrid environment. I see. And, uh, and on that theme, people are, are, are worried too that their lives are regulated, they're controlled by algorithms uh, that determine what we are shown, how we're contacted, what we're not shown. Can you explain how algorithms work within AI applications? So an AI algorithm is an extended subset of machine learning that tells the computer how to learn uh, and operate on its own. And in turn, this device or algorithm continue to gain knowledge to improve process and run tasks more efficiently. This is also what we call a digital feedback loop, right? A simple example, you know, on, on social media, on uh, our social, all of us use social media almost today. So it tells, it learns from you if you're clicking, seeing an ad uh, for a new headphones, and then you stare at that ad for three minutes. It will show you more ads of headphones of different types. Yeah. So it takes your feedback and provide it to improve uh, the customer experience in that case. Yeah. And yeah, when it comes it's to like a step towards the metaverse, Mohammed. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> the metaverse is, uh, let's say, taking the baby steps now. Yeah, start, yeah, so, yeah. A trillion dollar business. But I interrupted. Yeah. So um, if you finish that point, I, I, can I just ask you, uh, coming back directly to the energy industry uh, and the possible technological breakthroughs of the industry and the benefits they may bring to operations? Uh, I would say machine learning is definitely 
technological breakthrough uh, as it comes to prediction and stopping, you know, the failures, continue your operation, efficiency, and so on. And I think really the next wave is autonomous operation through reinforced learning. So um, that means that not only you can quantify the data, you know, um, you have subsets of data, how these dots organized, is this uh, A or B, which is heavier? This is the normal machine learning. Reinforced learning is when the machine learning algorithm can tell you what to do next or suggest to you. And then once you're comfortable with its suggestions and you try it enough, you deploy it in the field and it takes its own decisions. And this is very useful in the energy industry in a dynamic um, environment where you need an operator, for example, he adjusts his flow rate, set points, temperatures, pressures, and all this every hour, every two. But can you optimize it if you adjust it every two minutes, every one minute, every one second? And this is where autonomous operation comes in place to improve your efficiency and production and the quality of your product as well. Um, just a, a sidebar, Mohammed. I hope you don't mind me going off piste briefly, but I wonder for the energy industry whether or not cyber attacks are a cause for concern. Of course it is. Uh, we've seen the attacks, you know, in uh, North America and United States and how, uh, you know, uh, it affected the pipelines, it affected the power uh, and in Europe. So cybersecurity now is the base for everything that is done in the energy um there is it's uh let's say it's uh concerned for the operators we see a lot of customers concerned about cyber security not only on the internet and connectivity level but on the operation level nowadays attackers can exploit from simple devices that's why the it network starting to extend to go below the it and start scanning the devices in the operation as well the iot devices in the operation and how to secure it uh, as well. Okay, that, that, that's that's good, good, good to know. Uh, lastly, can computing have a major impact, do you think, in the fight against global warming by, I suppose, identifying where efficiencies in energy activities can be made? Definitely. I think this is the only way. Uh, I think there is a saying that says uh, sustainability is an outcome of your digital transformation effort. And that means if you are having real time monitoring of your energy efficiency, if you're optimizing that from autonomous operation, uh, if you're having real time monitoring of your emissions of your carbon footprint, methane, and you can act faster, you can send the people on the ground to fix that leak faster. Uh, if you have a drone to uh, detect it, this is definitely um, the reduction that you can see. I will put an example. We have a digital twin for sustainability with BP, Claire Ridge. It's a public story. You can Google it and see the video on YouTube. And BP is saying that if they deployed this across their different rigs, they can save up to 500 tons of CO2 yearly. Uh, this is just by optimizing the energy efficiency of that rig. Yeah. Well, uh, Mr. Hassan, that answer concludes what I think is a fascinating interview um, about some very complex issues explained very clearly. On behalf of the Alatea Foundation, I'd like to thank you for joining me today and for providing the foundation with your insights. And I look forward to hearing from you again in future.